Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. So um, my name is Paul Marley, Technical Training Manager from HIDAC in Australia. It's time for our, our next webinar in our filtration series. So this is number three. It's entitled uh, Evaluating Filter Performance. And I'm totally thrilled, of course, that you can join us. So without any further ado, let's get going. Okay, so this presentation, I anticipate it should go for half an hour max. Let's begin, shall we? So filtration webinar series that I'm presenting is basically going to be 11 uh, presentations. This is number three, evaluating filter performance. So um, after this, we're going to start looking at some of the uh, selections and solutions that are available to us. Moving on, uh, what makes an oil filter good? Okay, everyone's got a different idea about that. So I'm just going to use uh, an analogy here. Everyone has an opinion on a car. So what makes a car good? Okay, how do you gauge the performance of a car? There's a lot of things you can look at. The acceler acceleration rate of the car. How fast is it? Zero to 100. The badge or the mark, you know. Some people will say, look, I only buy Mercedes. Is an economical car good? Is a just a car, just the lowest possible price. Is that good? A lot of people will, of course, say, all I want is a reliable car. All I want is the lowest service fee. I don't want to pay $1,000 every time I get the oil changed. I demand a five-year warranty. I want one that resells well. I want a high NCAP safety rating. I've got a family. I want to fit three kids in the back plus a mother-in-law. You know, I've got a pram and golf clubs I carry around. Some people, of course, want those popping exhausts and, um, you know, <laughs> my wife once uh, insisted on it had to be a certain colour and uh, a lot of people find that important. And, of course, some people just want the loudest car. <laughs> so you can see that there's a lot of reasons why people are going to say, yeah, that is what's attractive to me. That's what's good. So everyone has their opinion and everyone has their reasoning, okay? What really changes here is the, the measuring stick. How do you measure performance? Okay, so in a car, there's so many different ways that you can evaluate good. With oil filtration, you can have the same similar argument, but of course, some of the passion that's there with cars isn't there, but sometimes it is. What makes a filter good? So some of the things that we could say make a filter good is high dirt holding capacity. We want it to be able to remove a lot of contamination from the system. A lot of people will say they just want the cheapest initial cost. I don't care if it bloody works, a filter's a filter. Regarding the replacement cost of the elements, some people just want that. Some people want high dirt removal efficiency. They're looking for the most efficient filter, one that requires the least element replacement. Okay, I don't, it's okay that filter element can cost a little more as long as it's in, as it's in there longer. One that does all the filtering in one pass of the fluid. Sometimes that's what people need. One that has a smallest physical size. One that has the highest rated pressure. You know, some people say, well, a car's better because that goes faster than that one. This one has a higher pressure. So sometimes that's important to people. And of course, you know, certainly in Australia, one that's available today. I don't care really about the filter. I need it now. Okay, and that makes sense, of course. But again, like cars, sometimes people just say brand. Brand is all that matters. I don't care. It's that brand. Okay, a little bit of that passion that we have with cars is there as well. And again, everyone has their opinion and everyone has their reasoning. But I will suggest that with regards to oil filtration, only one thing really matters. And that is the end result. What is there for the fluid cleanliness? That is all that matters. Because if you're choosing a filter for a reason other than cleanliness, I think your, your head's in the wrong place, okay? Really, the only measuring stick that we can use is the end result. Are we achieving the cleanliness we need? You know, if you're representing a technical product, you'll need to provide an assurance to your client that that filter's going to work as promised and you're going to achieve that cleanliness. So you have to have a clear measuring stick for filtration performance. And it's a difficult thing to sort of sell that before you've put it in the machine. So you need to have some standardized tests that are used to be able to promote a filter as doing a certain job. Okay, so let's have a very quick overview of the standardized ISO tests. The first one is uh, ISO 
3968, that's looking at the pressure loss across the filter element. It's basically telling us, well, you put a gauge before the filter, five times the diameter of the inlet tube, and 10 times the diameter away on the outlet, and we're going to measure the pressure change across that element there. Now, that may not you know, be something that's immediately obvious to you, but if you are, have ever selected a filter, that's what it gives you. Basically, the data that you're looking at, the pressure drop over the flow rate change, that's derived from that test. So that, that's an important test and standardized by our ISO. Another one is ISO 3724. This is a pressure fatigue test. Ultimately, you go to the rating of the indicator and bounce down to zero every second, on, off, on, off, on, off. And you're literally trying to break that element. This is a, a, a test that's going to give you an idea of how robust that filter element is. Certainly important in a dynamic system. Another test that's carried out is ISO 2491, a collapse resistance test. So in this test, basically, they build up the pressure and look at when the filter breaks, when it collapses. Okay, So that is basically the ultimate strength of that element. Very important in a dynamic system. Another test is ISO 2493 where they have a filter element and they put it in different fluids at certain temperatures and it's an accelerated aging test. So this is to prove that the filter doesn't change the fluid in any way and that the fluid doesn't change the filter in any way. It tests the integrity of or any glues or any materials used in the filter. Very important, of course, if you're going to use a single filter in multiple fluids as an option. Another test is the bubble point test, uh, ISO 2942. So in this particular case, a filter element is placed under a, a filtered isopropanol at a certain depth, half an inch from the top of the fluid, and you're looking at what pressure air bubbles hit the surface. So basically, this is a test of the integrity of the filter in its construction. Okay. Um, now, all of these tests aren't really commonly quoted. People don't talk about it often. One test that people do talk about often, if they're talking about filtration, is the ISO 16889 multipass test. So the multipass test is that you have a, a known level of a contaminant and you place that into a tank. You prepare it with this system, place it into a tank, then push it through a filter multiple times and you're looking at how the filter performs. This is basically then going to give you the results of the performance of the filter. So the multi-pass test, ISO 16889, this is um, 2008 is the current standard, but it has been reaffirmed in 2017. So it is, of course, a very modern test. And the test is actually called the multi-pass test because the standard is named hydraulic fluid power filters multi-pass method for evaluating filtration performance of a filter element. Now, the multi-pass test is an idealized hydraulic circuit in which the filter element under test is subjected to a constant flow rate. The size and number of contamination particles are calculated before and after the element. And the ratio of the number of particles of a certain size and larger before the element to after the element uh, the ratio indicates the performance of element removal, particle <laughs> removal, okay? So this value is known as the beta value. Now, the X in the formula here stands for the particle size. So you're looking at a beta value of a certain particle size, the number of those particles upstream and downstream of the filter greater than or equal to a certain size. And the C, by the way, means that it's been calibrated to the new test standard. Now, this is one test, one test that is important, but there is a plan. Another ISO standard, ISO 11170, talks about how, how all these tests are used in, to evaluate the performance of a product. And there's a few here that I haven't mentioned as well. But you can see, of course, there is definitely a standardized plan on how we test filter elements. This takes a lot of engineering time, a lot of clever people, and some highly specialized equipment. So ultimately, if you have a filter that hasn't been put through these tests and it just fits in a hole, how do you know it works?
Okay, so that's basically a look at all of the standards, but I want to look more particularly at the multipass test and understanding what that means. So the multipass test then, you're looking at the efficiency as a beta value or as a percentage. So you're looking at a beta value and as a percentage. And I've graphed it out to show how it kind of works. So this is the, the labels here are, are wrong, I'm sorry. So this is the efficiency in removal as a percentage. Okay, zero to 100%. And this is the beta value over here. Now you can see then that by the time you're at beta 75, you're already more than 98% effective. Okay, so it's a funny thing, the, the way it works is, is you, you basically have a lot of efficiency in removal as a percentage before the beta ratio goes up. Okay. The end result of that is that you actually have a reasonably low beta value at a reasonably high efficiency of removal. Now, one of the things that we see in our industry a lot is that one of our competitors says your filter has to be beta 1000. And um, I would suggest the beta 1000 isn't the most important thing. Um, I've just prepared two graphs here. One's at a beta 400 rating and one is at a beta 1000 rating. And you can look at those two figures there as an overall percentage. Now, they would have you understand that beta 400 is a low efficiency and beta 1000 is a high efficiency. Okay. Now, if this is a surprise to you that they're very, very close, then maybe you don't understand beta values and maybe they understand that that's their marketing edge. Okay. So I just thought I'd get the knife in there because it needs to be put in. So what is important then? What is important is beta stability. This is that the element is removing particles at a consistently high efficiency rate as the pressure changes across that element. Okay, And what we find consistently is the elements that are advertised to have a high beta ratio don't have a high beta stability. That is important. When you're catching a particle, you have to hold it. Dirt holding capacity is also evaluated with the multipass test, and that's important as well. And again, you catch a particle, you hold it, and you hold it tight, and you hold a lot of it. That is what makes a good filter. I just want to point out that there has been some changes to the multipass test over time. Now, you may have heard the term absolute and nominal rating. So an absolute rated element according to the current standard DIN 24550, a beta value of higher than 200 is deemed to be an absolute filter. At 200 beta value, we're at 99.5% efficiency of particle removal. So above 99.5%, it's considered to catch all particles. Okay. So you have the nominal filters and absolute filters. So it's not simply important that a high beta value is established. It's just as important that it's, you know, a high beta value is what is a good filter, and, and that's called absolute. Now, just want to go back a little step. The previous standard for the multipass test was an ISO 4572. With that particular standard, the beta value of 75 or above was considered to be absolute. Okay, so it's changed. They, they've actually lifted the bar a little bit. So now we have to be 99.5% efficient to be called absolute. And previously, 98.7% was good enough. So just to put it in context, ISO 4572 is a standard from 1981. That was replaced in 1999 by the new multipass test, test method, ISO 16889. Okay. Now, the reason I'm talking about the old standard here is because we still see that marketed in Australia, there's quite a few elements by competitors that are labelled as absolute filtration. And they're not absolute filtration anything closer than 20 years ago. Okay. So it's about time they change their labels. Okay. They're dealing with 40 year old tests. The world's moved on a little bit. Okay. So when you're looking at beta values, which test are they referring to? It's worth looking. You might be surprised when you look at your brand if it's not a high deck. Okay, and I um, just want to point out one little thing, though, as well. The beta value is established with the multipass test. And with the multipass test, you have a set pressure, and the pressure doesn't change. And you have a set flow rate, and the flow rate doesn't change. So you basically are 
challenging that filter element with contaminated fluid at a constant flow and pressure. Okay, so that's not at all like a real machine in how a machine is going to work, particularly if it's a dynamic machine such as hydraulic. Okay, so what Heidek are doing to work around that and to actually simulate a more closer result to what's seen in industry is we have this thing called a hydraulic load cycle test. Now, we've got videos and things on that. I'm not prepared to show them because as far as I can see, they're not in the public domain. So I'm just, I've just got an image from that video here. Beautiful video though. But basically, they describe this as what they do is we can go out to a machine with some of our diagnostic tools and we can get the pressure patterns over time of how that machine works. With that data, we can feed that into the test rig and the test rig can simulate then similar pressure changes and similar cycle changes to actually come up with a more accurate test. Now, again, this is not as accurate as, of course, real life. So you have the beta testing, which is that you have on the actual machine. And that's different to the beta rating. So the beta testing is that you've got the product and you're trying it in the field. Okay. So there's really three levels, multipass testing, hydraulic load cycle testing, and above that is actual real life, actual machine. Okay. And the actual performance is measured there. And again, that's a very important thing that that is um, established to be meeting your needs. And that is ultimately in a dynamic system, you are getting clean fluid. Okay, so that's about all I have to talk about with today. Um, this is um, has been episode three of 11. So there's eight more to go. Be sure to collect the set. We'd love you to subscribe to our feed. We have other webinars by other presenters on many other topics. And it's a, it's a pleasure presenting these to you. So um, it has been an absolute pleasure presenting this today. So if you've missed the webinar, go to YouTube. Um, number one and number two are there, as are many others from HIDAC as well. So it's a pleasure presenting these webinars to you. I wish you a very good day, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining us.